I'm Doug Hamilton. I head up uh, AI research at NASDAQ. And what I like to do with these usually is start off with a little, a little statistics joke because it's a hilarious field full of people with wonderful sense of humor. So an ex walks into a bar. It was a pretty average experience. Yeah, that sounds about fair. Uh, so, right. So I head up AI research at NASDAQ. And today what we're going to talk about is this notion of dynamic market structure. And we're going to talk about it largely in the context of something called market efficiency. Um, market efficiency is this notion that markets should be really, really, really good at telling us about not just the current price of things, but also the near-term future price of things. And we're going to dive into this quite a bit more later. Throughout this talk, we're going to explore a number of odd idiosyncratic behaviors in the market, both from a perspective of pricing, liquidity, and volume, that suggest to us that markets aren't efficient. We'll also talk about some modern notions of market inefficiency. And then we're going to close out by kind of looking over the role of AI in making markets more efficient by creating something called a dynamic market restructure. So you can see those items listed here. So first, we're going to talk a little about the data that we work with day to day at NASDAQ. So at NASDAQ, we run uh, you know, one of the largest equities exchanges in the world. I believe we're actually the second largest equities exchange in the world. Uh, a handful, about six options exchanges here in the United States. Uh, accounted for about 33% of all trading volume here in the US. Uh, we account for a huge amount of trading volume in Europe through our Nordic exchanges, and of course, our software powers a large number of exchanges around the world as well. Every day, we generate two terabytes of, uh, of data across our exchanges. And that might seem kind of pedestrian to this crowd, but the thing to remember here is that this is two terabytes of 8-bit messages about trading, rather than pictures of cats and dogs and people's food or 280 character temper tantrums about other people's 280 character temper tantrums. So it's, it's pretty interesting data. It's very low level though. And it has enormously low information content on a per observation basis. That is merely seeing that an order came in doesn't tell you a whole lot about the future state of the world, nor does it really tell you much about what that person's gonna do next. So our, the individual pieces of information that we have very, add very little kind of predictive capacity. There's also this notion that within um, financial markets, as anybody who works in the field will tell you, uh, non-stationarity is pretty rampant. Uh, you know, we discuss this in any number of ways. Uh, sometimes we refer to it kind of uh, sterilely as different market regimes, uh, though my favorite way to explain this is that the, whatever caused the last recession is never gonna, not going to be the cause of the next one. Um, right? We didn't even have cryptocurrency in 2007. And Finally, you know, there's these, this notion of really complex long and short-term dependency as well. Uh, there's some great work on this by uh, Gabe and uh, Koshin, I think, uh, called the inelastic market hypothesis, which is a modern view of kind of how markets work that's less about, that's about long-term efficiency and short-term what we'd call kind of shock and restitution. Uh, so prices are shocked by inflows of, of capital and then they proceed towards uh, proceed towards efficiency later on. Now, this, of course, is somewhat contrary to, to a more efficient view of markets that says that we should be able to easily absorb those prices. So when you have all of these problems, right, non-stationarity, when you have huge amounts of low information content data, when you have complex dependencies, you know, solutions like the ones that Databricks provide become quite essential. Right? We need huge amounts of parallelized compute and, and, and kind of node-oriented compute in order to process all this information, create interesting metrics that we can then turn into insights. Uh, we need very, very complex uh, modeling tools in order to be able to create somewhat bespoke models uh, that can turn that low information content into something useful. Finally, we also need ways to track those models both in production and in research because, as we know, we're we go through many market regimes uh, over the course of our lives, whether it's uh, different bull market regimes or, of course, you know, the, the, the tumult of business cycle. So all of these things combine to really create a complex modeling environment that requires uh, state-of-the-art tools to handle. So with that said, now we can get into the meat of it. So the meat of what we're going to discuss today is market efficiency. Uh, do people here kind of understand broadly the concept of market efficiency? Cool. So can we see a show of hands? Yeah, awesome. Cool. How many people here think markets are wicked and efficient? Okay. Oh, you guys. You should quit your day jobs and trade then. Um, so let's talk about market efficiency. 
So when we talk about market efficiency, for those of you less, less, uh, less in the know, what we're usually talking about is the ability for markets to predict things, but we also talk about it in terms of some key metrics. And the key metrics we like to talk about at NASDAQ are liquidity and transparency. So transparency means the ability to see how prices are formulated. If you want to see how a price is formulated on our exchange, you can do this in any number of ways. You can see the historical uh, prevailing price over time, as an example, uh, which is completely transparent. You can see many levels of what we call the order book, uh, or the best bids and offers within the nation. And all of this kind of shows us how prices evolve over time. Highly, highly transparent. And of course, modern financial markets are also deeply, deeply liquid. Um, going back to kind of the Econ 101 definition of liquidity, this is how quickly you can turn your asset into cash. And that's a great definition if you're talking about, you know, housing versus stocks. But here we also talk oftentimes about something called the spread, right? Uh, and the volume at different levels around the spread, which is how much does it cost you to trade because you were willing to buy, sell at the higher price, but now you have to sell at the slightly, you know, two pennies below. So all those things come into uh, context when we're talking about liquidity. But again, modern financial markets are deeply liquid. And, and for many of the most liquid symbols, the ones that we're very familiar with day to day, those spreads are going to be very tiny relative to the price that we pay. But not all markets are equally as efficient as modern capital markets. You know, if you were to go to your local farmer's market, you'd actually see a fairly high level of, uh, of liquidity and a modest level of price transparency. Not quite what you'd see uh, in financial markets, but certainly, you know, you could compare duck egg A to duck egg B and figure out if they are, you know, from different vendors, being sold at reasonably the same price and how we came to those prices. Likewise, you know, if you're really clever, um, you can, these markets are also very liquid. If you find, for example, in, or an enterprising young, young person, uh, find two people selling apples for different prices, you got an opportunity for arbitrage right there. So, you know, these are pretty liquid places as well. But many markets in our world, and many of the most important markets, are not as liquid, for example, or transparent, housing. Uh, housing's a pretty illiquid and, and non-transparent market, right? Um, hard to move in and out of a house, physically, emotionally, and financially. It is difficult to, uh, to relinquish a, a rental contract, whether you are the rentor or the rentee. Um, and frankly, the reason why prices are set the way they are, while it's more transparent today than it used to be, can still be uh, mind-numbingly confusing, right? I've, it's never been clear why the person who's moving out of the apartment must pay a higher price, and considerably so sometimes, with 20 or 30% higher, than the person who moves in right behind them uh, with rebates that, that people often set. It's very odd. Probably is a something to do with accounting and taxes. That's usually what the case. And then, of course, there's everybody's least favorite market, well, aside from the people who are sending the bill, uh, medicine, uh, which is highly liquid, incredibly opaque. Nobody know, even knows what the prices are. Uh, very hard to return a kidney transplant. And, um, and, and the only people who benefit from this really are the people selling the, uh, selling the service itself. So we should get kind of get a gut feel at this point why we want our markets to be efficient. We like trading stonks. We like it when we go to the farmer's market and can buy and sell, you know, buy and sell fresh food easily. We don't like renting and buying houses nearly as much, and nobody likes dealing with hospital billing. So let's put this into a slightly more formal context. So when we think about market efficiency, there's usually three flavors that people talk about. Uh, the first flavor is this weak notion that all we're seeing when we look at prices in deeply liquid, highly, uh, highly transparent, minimally frictive um, financial markets or markets in general are the historical prices, and they tell us nothing about the future. Th this is probably incorrect. Um, it's probably more efficient than that. The other extreme that we'll discuss here is what we'll call the very strong or the strong uh, efficient market hypothesis. This says that all information, public and private, and here when we say private, think hidden, is already incorporated in pricing. So anybody here who thinks about you know, prediction for a living should know right away that this can't be true. Because one great example of hidden information is the far future. And if markets were perfectly efficient, we wouldn't have you know, the pro steady progress of technology. Because as soon as the Dutch started trading coffee in coffee houses, we would have had supercomputers. Um, and that's 
quite a ridiculous statement. It's also true that even if we remove that hidden aspect from it and just say that, uh, that public and private information are incorporated, uh, we kind of know that a really good way but super illegal way to make money is to engage in insider trading. Um, and so that kind of causes this, this notion that private information is incorporated in price to fall on its face. The, the prevailing view, I think, on, on market efficiency today is that we're somewhere in between, right? Most public information is incorporated. Most public information, it, it, even some private information is there, but not necessarily insider information, more like uh, satellite photos of, of parking lots and what that tells you about future prices as well, is all kind of baked into the price. And when we find these inefficiencies, or when we find new information and bring it to the market, we're addressing some of the inefficiency of the market that way. So we talked about some of the reasons we know uh, specifically that markets kind of fall into this category of somewhat efficient. But really, the way we know this kind of in our gut is the effects we would expect to see versus the ones we actually see. Uh, the first is that we would have no risk-adjusted returns or no opportunities for arbitrage whatsoever, right? We don't have an opportunity for arbitrage intertemporally. We don't have an ar opportunity for ar arbitrage contemporaneously. And we don't have an opportunity for arbitrage even statistically. Um, and, you know, while there's plenty of debate to be had about the degree to which uh, asset managers justify the very, you know, very high, um, very high management fees, right? There's no, uh, as, as one of my favorite asset managers likes to say, there's there's no, uh, no investment so good that it can't be made bad by a sufficiently high fee. Um, we also know that there certainly are opportunities for arbitrage in the market that do pop up. Uh, the second thing that we would expect to see is that price moves are very, very rare. Um, if you want to know more about how not rare big price movements are, there's two things you could do. One, I'd recommend reading, uh, actually, Mandelbrot of Fractal. Fractal's fame has done a lot of work in this area. Uh, and then the second is um, go check your uh, E-Trade account. That they're, they're, they're very common and they tend to be very negative. Um, as opposed to the day-to-day -day kind of tumult and, and slow buildup of one and 2% gains over time. The last thing we'd expect to see is time state independence of return, liquidity, and risk. Uh, and what this basically means is this is that the random walk hypothesis. And while returns are difficult to predict, uh, one, of the, one of the things we've noted over you know, the last few decades is that volatility that is kind of tumult in the markets actually occurs in clusters, right? And is, is considerably more predictable than, um, than the returns themselves, which is an interesting observation. These three things kind of form, these three um, effects that we observe kind of form a confluence that ultimately convinces us that no, there's, there's room to go in terms of market efficiency. So, we are going to talk about the causes of market inefficiency, but before we get there, it's important to understand the exchange ecosystem. Because a lot of the causes that we're going to talk about are microstructure. When we say microstructure, we're referring to this ecosystem and how it interacts with each other. So when we think about the exchange ecosystem, usually we think about four different types of players. There are people who seek capital. These people are oftentimes forgotten after the IPO, but you know, people who are looking to, to raise capital in public markets. Uh, so these are corporations looking to get money. There are liquidity providers, which are people like uh, market makers, who go in and make sure that you can trade at relatively low prices, or at lo with relatively low friction. Uh, they'll say nasty things like, ah, oh, you know, I really ripped that guy off because I bought it at 99.99, but I would have done it for 99.98. But, you know, for you as an average investor, or me as an average investor just trying to fund a trip to Disneyland, I don't care if I saw it $199.99. Uh, that is, our, our goals are pretty different, which helps us trade. Uh, the third group that we're looking for is the people who are seeking to make our markets more efficient by exploiting existing inefficiency. So these are, you know, some, some aspects of high-frequency traders, hedge funds, et cetera. They're all looking for inefficiencies that can be exploited. Uh, and of course, the last group are then more long-term investors, which are those retail investors. Like, like myself, uh, or asset managers who are, who are taking uh, discretionary investment steps with institutional sizes of money. So this is the group. What we do is, uh, as market uh, exchange providers then, is we actually design exchanges to try to capture different aspects of this group of people, right? Whether it's different, uh, different parameters that help, that entice corporations to list on us, uh, 
different parameters that entice people to trade on us, different parameters that entice market makers has come to make the spread really small so it's not as expensive for you to get out of your position. And we, can, we have a number of parameters that we can look at. A few that we have listed here are something we call maker-taker versus fee-fee, which is really how, does a tr how do the people engaging in the trade make sure the exchange gets paid, because I like getting paid. You can think about exchange differences in exchanges of being floor versus electronic. Uh, something, a kind of newer idea called speed bumps, which is what are the advantages of actually slowing an exchange down a little bit. And uh, auctions versus two-sided order books. These are all great examples of different ways that we design exchanges in order to entice different areas of aspects of the market. So when we do that, uh, we've, we've done that quite a bit here in the US. Um, what's kind of unique about the US compared to many other places in the world is that we have many, many, many uh, exchanges uh, that are very transparent um, and have created many, many different markets that, that attract different players. Uh, so you have some markets that are very big and very fast, like NASDAQ and NYSE. Uh, you have some markets that are a little bit slower, but are intentionally so, like IEX. Uh, then you have some markets that you scratch your head as to why they exist, like the long-term stock exchange. And each of these has basically parameterized themselves in a different way in order to attract different segments of the market. And you can't, and certainly some of them attract m much larger segments of the market, but there's really a considerable amount of uh, volume that's spread around across all of them. So now that we've talked a little about how exchanges actually operate and how they think about designing markets and how they think about parameterizing them in these different sorts of ways, we now dive into market inefficiency and why we know, not just at a very high level, that markets are inefficient, but specific things we see in markets rather um, continuously that, that make us believe that something is amiss here. So my favorite actually example, kind of pop example of market inefficiency is there was a study done some years ago on uh, volatility throughout the year. And the study found that in August, volatility spikes. And the reason for this seems to be that um, in August, people like to take vacation. And of course, the people who get priority for that vacation are the more senior people. So your senior traders leave the uh, trading floor and you're left with kind of very junior, very fidgety people who uh, react maybe not, who haven't been uh, filtered out, let's say, um, as well. At, you know, time's such a great way to take people who maybe are, don't have quite the right temperament and put them into an, a, another area where they can do their best work. But what we see year over year is that uh, volatility in August, a little higher than the rest of the year. So that's kind of cool. So more effects like that. But let's talk about why these markets aren't actually efficient. So there's four core reasons here that we're, we'll kind of hone in on. The first is that markets just can't be, right? We have imperfect information, maybe they're in, there's asymmetric information. So we know that markets aren't gonna be perfectly efficient that, for that reason, right? Um, we know that we don't really play in worlds of nicely resolvable parametric statistics. That's a great reason too, that all kind of fall into this kind of very information-driven view of market inefficiency. The second one is what we call behavioral biases. You know, this, this is the entire field of behavioral economics uh, to a certain extent, if we wanna to go to that earlier example, volatility in August. Um, a really great way to, uh, to avoid getting canned maybe during that time is to follow the old adage of, um, you know, sell in May and walk away. Uh, you can't have volatility if you're not trading or don't have a portfolio. Uh, and that would be an example of kind of a survivorship bias, right? You're not really trying to maximize what you're getting by trading. You're just trying to make sure you get your bonus and get to play again next year. There's, of course, regulatory friction. Um, we're not gonna cover that too much, but of course, the, the more rules, laws, and regulations that you have that govern a trade, the harder physically it is to actually conduct that trade, and that creates friction. The last one that we're really gonna dive into is what we call microstructure, and this is the mechanics of trading. When we talk about trading uh, in Econ 101 or 401 or whatever it might be, we always imagine it on a blackboard. And blackboards are nice, uh, really nice trading environments because and as well as thought experiments, because they have no latency. Um, they don't have to deal with the fact that like atoms have to do things in order for trades to get transacted on silicon. Um, but the speed of light is real SOB and means that we, have to, we naturally have limits to how minimally frictive trading can be just from, from a temporal perspective. Of course, there's other reasons as well, right? There's issues around clearing, pricing, priority, preference auction parameterization, and the player ecosystem itself that we talked about a little earlier. 
All of these are large contributors to the broader notion that of, of microstructure that's inefficient. And here's, here's a, an example from 2019. So if we thought pricing was really efficient, liquidity was really efficient, everything was allocated well, we, should, we would expect to see the distribution of liquidity look a lot more normal than what we actually see here. Uh, this, is, this looks a lot more like a power distribution that's done steroids, right? This is a, few, a small handful of stocks that attract all of the volume and all of the trading, and then a huge tail that attracts none. And these aren't rinky-dink names either. This, this is the NASDAQ 100 uh, and at the time of 2019. So, you know, you have Facebook and Tesla in this time, meta today, um, soaking up lots of, lots of volume. And then you have, you know, much smaller firms like uh, NVIDIA soaking up much less, right? And that's really not something you should expect to see in an efficient space. There's... Other places where we see this inefficiency are when we have weird information things happen in exchanges. Uh, this is a study actually from our Nordic exchange where we look at volatility throughout the day and volatility relative to the actual closing price. And what we do in our exchanges in, in the Nordics is at some point you have to shut them down for the day and you have to figure out a good way to take the book and close it. And so we run an auction at the end of the day. But Towards the end of the day, we also stop, the, the book of the auction is hidden from the world. And there's also some randomization in when the auction actually uh, executes. This is done to avoid the kind of gamesmanship that we can see in auctions that, that is generally deleterious to, um, to price discovery. So at some point, the market kind of gets cut off from information writ large and volatility goes crazy. And it does this every single day. So that's a pretty good example of something we should expect not to see if people are able to, in kind of the, the, the financial equivalent of spooky action at a distance, see these prices simply by moving the markets or simply by watching the markets in the near-term future. And so like we say, every time what we see is uh, information gets cut off, volatility initially spikes, a little new information starts to leak out, which causes it to come down, but then it eventually settles a little while later. And, and this information gap causes this huge volatility spike every single day. So we've walked through a few, what I think are very good examples of non-price related, um, non related inefficiency. And to be clear, the reason why we're talking about non-price related inefficiency is uh, as a market, I don't trade on my exchanges, I don't care about the price of things as much. Um, you know, so that's, we care more about these other factors like volatility, volume, transparency, and liquidity. So let's talk about AI and dynamism and how we're gonna get around some of these issues. So the thing we should note here is that many, many aspects of inefficiency aren't always equally sensitive to the parameterization of the market, right? And so there's opportunity here to use market information uh, and AI in order to get ourselves around that. So let's talk about how NASDAQ thinks about AI really quickly. So the way we see AI is not as a set of esoteric algorithms to be implemented or as you know, a, a number of cognitive services to be consumed, but rather as four kind of key capabilities that are very, very difficult to code for by hand. Uh, we call these control, which is the ability to make real-term predict, real-time decisions um, in a very complex and dynamic environment. Uh, perception, which of course the ability to interpret the world somewhat like a human, though hopefully a little bit better, uh, or at least not considerably worse. Prediction, the ability to find kind of hidden relationships between things and time. And then finally, interaction. We don't use this one quite as much, which, you know, the ability to, to react to new inputs from computers or by computers. So that's how we think about this on the technical side, right? These four capabilities that would be very difficult to code for. Um, as you can imagine, we'll be talking a lot about control and perception going, or prediction going forward. We also think about it, though, in terms of three kind of business use cases. And the first one's something we call the deep blue principle. This is the notion that some things computers are just better at, right? And they should be. Computers should be better at us than at chess, right? It's weird that people still play chess in some, to some degree because computers are much, much better at it. And there's many of these kind of big, nasty, mathy optimization problems that computers should be better at. And so, you know, we think about applications in that regard. 
The second is what we call human level performance. I, I think he's talking to Mara, right? Uh, which is inspired by Andrew Ng, who, who says that you know, any, any mental task, any cognitive task that you can do in about a second is probably an, uh, an opportunity for automation. And if you chain a lot of one second tasks together, all of a sudden you have a much more complex task. The final one that we talk about is uh, digital nudging. And these, these are systems that don't actually have to be as good as a person in order to provide a lot of value because they just operate so many times. You know, it's entirely possible, uh, if you want to think about the trading space again, that a human trader might be better at executing a trade to, to collect more spread than a computer is because of their years of experience. However, they can't do it 100 million times a day. Um, and if you can do, if you can pick up a penny 100 million times a day, you, you've made some money. That's a pretty good paycheck, actually. So these are the three ways we usually think about it. And in the context of financial markets, what this usually means is how do we, how do we better control our parameters? How do, we, how do we assist to reduce the friction of actually interacting with the market? And then how do we make small improvements on our billions of transactions a day in order to provide value to our clients? So the first one that we'll talk about here is uh, the first application of kind of a control problem, is what we'll call uh, pricing with dynamic pricing with dynamic costs. So harkening back to what we talked about a little earlier, market quality, this notion of, of market stability, is very sensitive to the design factors of the market itself, right? But that sensitivity changes day by day. Sometimes having a higher price might be bad. Other times it might be not so bad. Sometimes having a slower market might be better. Other times it might be worse. Uh, you know, it's measured by different factors. Market operators, it turns out, we already manage our markets today in lots of interesting ways. Um, and, and anybody familiar with circuit breakers? We got some people who are, I know who here are. Uh, but if any of you followed um, you know, the, the GameStop fiasco last year, there was all this stoppage in trading that occurred, and that's because we had huge amounts of volatility in the market. If there's huge amounts of volatility, markets intercede and throw circuit breakers to try to return some sense of normalcy and sanity to the world. And those actually work incredibly well at doing exactly that. So we know, we know that exchange providers already engage in this sort of kind of proactive management to create higher market quality. But operators can take a, a very kind of sophisticated view of what pricing means here in order to create dynamic pricing with dynamic costs. Now, sometimes that might be explicit by changing something like the maker-taker spread. This is a, a difference in how much we would pay a market maker to provide liquidity versus charge a market uh, liquidity taker to take it off the book. It might be looking at how we slow down markets with speed bumps, so you pay a price and how long you wait. And the price you'd really pay there in order to have this higher market quality would be typically what we'd see as lower fill rates. However, those fill rates are not always gonna be lower in the same sort of ways. And then finally is this notion of market population, right? Making sure that we have the right sorts of people playing in the market at any point in time. So looking at this notion of, dy of strictly dynamic price, uh, a few years ago, we ran an agent-based simulation where our agent was basically allowed to do one of two things. It could either place a market order or it could place a, um, a limit order, that is an order onto the books, at the inside of the market. And what we did is we taught this agent to maximize its returns. And then we changed the make or take your spread on it a lot and saw to see what it would do. And it turns out that what it does is not universal across all different types of symbols. Symbols that have very high prices and very low liquidity see very different, very different sensitivities to changes in the spread than symbols with low price and high, with low price and high liquidity. And some of the results are a little bit idiosyncratic. For example, um, you know, the agent kind of learned to go from a purely market, uh, market making or market taking to liquidity making um, strategy at, as the, as the uh, what's called inverted, as the spread inverted. But you know, it's really this is a great way that we can, that we began to investigate this question of how how does price impact liquidity? And can we find idiosyncratic pricing strategies that maintain liquidity and, and liquidity availability uh, while making sure that we don't funnel it all to just a few names? Another thing we've looked, we're, we're looking at is this question of optimal speed bumps. So 
What if we could slow down the market for very particular sets of traders who'd like to operate in a slower market? What, the way this is done today by exchanges is effectively an exchange will say that we're gonna slow down the market by 800 microseconds. And every single trade is just gonna have to sit and wait 800 microseconds before it can execute. And this will be the case for all symbols and all market environments. And we do this in order to ma manage two things. One is what we call toxicity or market impact of the trade. So this goes back to that question of inelasticity. That is how can we make sure that our markets can absorb inflows of capital uh, more, more efficiently, as well as making sure we get filled, right? Because that's the price we pay for slower markets is lower, lower rates of fill. Uh, that is making sure there's some counterparty that comes in and says, yes, I'd like to make this trade with you, which ultimately is the goal, hopefully. So it turns out that always having the same market, always having the same speed bump or the same delay on those orders is not always optimal. What we're looking at here are actually three different days where we sought to optimally manage this trade-off by, by changing the timer every 30 seconds, changing the delay every 30 seconds. And what we're looking at here is the evolution of, the, of that optimal timer uh, using uh, agent-based simulation and uh, deep reinforcement learning. So where, where does that leave us? Giving this a few takeaways. First, given the size and complexity of the data involved, tools like Spark and Databricks are absolutely essential to probing this question of dynamic markets and the kinds of solutions that are gonna to lead to them. Second, now if, if we see that markets are indeed context aware, then dynamism is a natural solution in order to, to overcome some of the inefficiencies that we see in kind of a pernicious and everyday sort of way. The dynamism unlocked by AI will in fact improve market quality, and this will improve uh, price discovery, which in many regards is one of an exchange's core financial or core goods to society. So that concludes the talk, and we have two minutes and 40 seconds for questions. Questions, guys? A few minutes. Hey Douglas, uh, th uh, thanks for your talk. So my question is, do you think this AI is only uh, can discover this uh, short-term quality for stock market? Because for long-term investment strategy, mainly it's defined by its fundamental uh, value and uh, yeah. economy yeah, output. What do you think yeah. of that? I think, I think that's a great question. Um, so if we go back to kind of the, the core conflict here that we're discussing is, efficient markets versus inelastic markets. And I think that echoes exactly what you're saying, right? Uh, inelastic markets are locally inefficient and long-term efficient, right? So if you're talking about somebody with a discretionary investment hypothesis that's gonna come to fruition over five or 10 years, these sorts of microstructural elements probably matter quite a bit less. But to people, but to everybody else in the market, the people who are enabling folks with discretionary investment strategies, to get in and out of those positions efficiently as the world changes. To those people, these aspects matter quite a bit more, right? Um, and so, and you need both because you need to have, a, you always need a counterparty, right? And if you don't have a counterparty, then you can't, you can't get out of your position when you want to as a discretionary investor. But no, I think you're, I think you're absolutely correct that much of this is focused on making a, an environment that attracts that attracts liquidity and spreads it out uh, equitably across, across our names. And that makes it easier for people with uh, you know, idiosyncratic discretionary investment theses to engage in public markets. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, you mentioned GameStop fiasco a little while ago. Is there some sort of uh, AI approach that can be implemented to identify any problems that brokers are having uh, in the future so that there's no st stopping trading? You know, this is something we, we definitely discussed once internally, and there, there's a few challenges there. One is that it turns out our, the modern circuit breaker strategy is really good at uh, return, bringing sanity back to the markets. Um, you know, whether it's it, short, short times for people just to take a breath or longer periods, slightly longer periods of time for people to switch in and out uh, the appropriate algorithms. Um, the other issue there is when you talk about actually turning off the market, 
uh, reacting to an event like that, you want to be very deterministic in how you do it. Um, and you don't want your AI thinking that your Apple is an iPod, right? Uh, you don't want your AI thinking that perfectly normal, reasonable behavior reacting to um, reacting to news or um, earnings calls is actually uh, the kind of the kind of behavior that you'd like to take a beat to overcome. So I think that's an area where I would probably avoid applying AI as a as a first uh, first line of defense. Yeah. You guys, one last question before before we head out for lunch. Can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on how, how the architecture behind the speed bumps, how you vary so, that? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Can you elaborate on the architecture behind the speed bump? Uh, yeah, so we, we can elaborate on the speed bump a little more, right? So the way a speed bump works is you place an order and it's not allowed to, to trade for a certain amount of time, right? The idea behind this is that it physically slows the market down for everybody. Um, so, you know, if you think that some people have an advantage because of speed, you might want, not want to play with them. So a bunch of people decide we want to play in a slower market. Now, most people don't care, don't, don't care as much, right? Um, so you don't have the same density of trading that, density of quoting that occurs. That's people looking to trade. With lower density of quoting, you'd expect to see your orders filled. That is, a counterparty come in and say, yes, I'd like to trade with you less often. Right, so this is the, what speed bumps are doing. Now the question is, how do we manage that delay based on market conditions in such a way that we can see improvement both in the rates at which we're filled and the ability to not impact the markets or, or you know, what we call toxicity, which is adverse selection. That is, seeing the price move against you in the near term future.